This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today's episode, it's titled Jesus Didn't Exist. So I'm not pulling a fast one on you. Like I didn't change my entire worldview or anything. So don't get all freaked out. It'll all make sense here in a little bit why I named it that. But I got to kind of go back to about a week ago uh, when the idea for this podcast came. So this is like the third week in a row where I was going to be talking about a particular subject and then something else happened and I had to like scrap the whole deal and start on something new. So uh, this story starts as uh, many great stories do uh, with a beef on Twitter. So uh, I'll bring you up to speed this way. So a lot of you know who Derek Carr is. So Derek Carr is quarterback of uh, the Oakland Raiders, soon to be the Las Vegas Raiders. And he is obviously an outspoken Christian as well. So even before he got his huge contract, I think it was before last season or whatever, he was just been an outspoken Christian this entire time. So he's an easy target for a lot of people that are on the cultural left or the atheist left, those types of folks. And uh, the story started with um, him and then it ended with a guy named Arian Foster. So you probably know who Arian Foster is. He's a now retired running back, but he spent, I think it was six seasons with uh, the Texans as a running back and one season with the Dolphins, made the Pro Bowl a couple of times, led the league in in touchdowns a few times, so had a decent career. Um, This is a guy who ESPN made him a hero during his career because he came out of the closet as atheist. Like, that's kind of how ESPN treated this. Like, he was some sort of hero. It's like, you know, you got uh, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and then this guy. That's kind of like how how it goes with a lot of different people, right? Um, So he comes out as atheist. He's seen as a hero for being so bold to do something like that. You know, a guy that was raised Muslim uh, and then now uh, is living as an atheist, which, interestingly enough, I wonder if he believes or knows that the Muslim faith thinks that he's an apostate that should die now, but I'll digress from that point. So here's how the story started. So Derek Carr put a tweet out there. And so I'll read the tweet to you and then I'll read kind of what, where it all went from there. So the tweet read this by Derek Carr. I've seen with my eyes, what miraculous things happen in the name of Jesus. There is no harsh word or smart person that can take that away. Okay, so, I mean, not really a crazy statement by anyone who uh, is a member of the Christian faith and has a discipleship uh, set up with Jesus. Uh, But Arian Foster, who, you know, is no longer relevant in terms of the NFL, he decided he needed to subtweet Derek Carr. And he subtweeted and said simply, a.k.a. confirmation bias. So obviously the atheist is trying to get over with kind of like a cheeky comment against a a well-known and famous Christian And so I responded to Arian Foster, not something that I normally do anymore. I don't really try to get into Twitter battles with anybody, but I was just like being sarcastic with him. And this was my response. I said, man, you're so woke. I mean, you have no baseline understanding of your own worldview or how you came to it, but yeah, sure. So woke. And so that's what I tweeted back. And and I just kind of left it because that's the thing is this is a guy who's operating as an atheist, but he doesn't have the foggiest idea of where his worldview comes from. He just doesn't have an idea. He's operating under Western constraints within his brain without even the foggiest clue as to how those constraints got there kind of, you know, the whole Judeo-Christian influence of, of the world he's even living in and the country he made his millions in. Right. And Foster apparently didn't think that was uh, good enough just to leave it there. So he subtweeted me, posted it for all his followers and says, this bout as deep as a pothole. So obviously this guy is quite the, quite the theologian, quite the, quite the scholar. So this bout as deep as a pothole. And so I responded to him as well. Cause you know, I was like, okay, if we're going to go there, like let's, let's keep this going and let's, let's try to be, let's try to be cogent. Let's try to be polite. But I basically said uh, this in response to Arian Foster, you attack a disciple of Christ for his historically facts-based belief system, but you couldn't even fully articulate how an evolutionary biologist or naturalist comes to understand morality. If you tried deep enough or shall we keep digging? And he, he came right back and said, let's dig. You're asserting that it's a quote, historically fact-based and try to follow me. It's, it's kind of broken up English a little bit here, but this is what he said. Theologians don't agree on this. Even if I granted that lends no credence or zero credence to modern day. Also demonstrably false things in there. And morality is based on societal norms. Even your Bible proves this. So my response to him uh, after that, and this is kind of where it starts to flame out, this was my response. Historically verifiable facts. Jesus of Nazareth existed. He ministered publicly for around three years. He was crucified under Roman rule. He died. He was placed in a tomb. Over 500 people saw him alive a few days later. All has been disputed, but none disproven. He went pretty quiet. 
after that one. So I'm not going to say I, I just kind of threw down the gauntlet and all that, but maybe he just lost interest in the conversation. Who knows? But he goes pretty quiet, and that, that seems kind of par for the course. But I even invited him to speak offline. You know, hey, you know, I know that nobody changes their opinions based on what somebody just puts out there on Twitter, or very few people would rather. And I invited to have a discussion, you know, send a DM with my with my phone number or whatever. Uh, he didn't seem to, uh, to respond to that. So apparently the last thing I said was the last thing he wanted to hear. He just wasn't interested in talking further, but you know, considering the fact that you know I've I've got a few thousand followers and he's got uh, several dozen thousand followers. I can't remember. It's maybe a few hundred thousand followers. So it kind of got some attention from some different folks, um, and then just basically, I'm just getting flooded with comments because these are all his followers, right? So if you're following Arian Foster, you're you're a fan of his. Maybe you're a fan of his ideology, or uh, maybe you're an atheist as well. And so uh, most of the comments that I got were just trash. They were useless. It's just people online being dumb. Uh, some were polite and calculated. I'll, I'll put that in the very few category. Very few of those were polite and calculated. Uh, but there was one theme that kind of came about as I was going through some of these responses. And I didn't respond to a whole lot of people, and I tried to keep it, you know, very facts base and, you know, not go after anybody in particular, because again, you're online, you're just flaming people if you're just getting all mad and all that kind of stuff. But the theme that came out was that several, several of the people that responded to me think Jesus didn't exist. I mean, like the, the historical Jesus, they think that that guy never existed, right? I know it, it like sounds crazy. And, and I understand how a lot of people can question Jesus's divinity Sure. I mean, I can absolutely see why somebody would do that. Uh, I mean, there's a myriad of worldviews that kind of go contrary to Jesus's divinity and the story of that. Right. But not his existence. Right. And so this got me curious is like, is this a thing? Do people like honestly think that this is a guy that didn't exist? Um, and, and I just started doing a little bit of research and the research kind of blew me away. It, it really kind of threw me for a loop. I found a recent study that was done in the UK. It was done in 2015 where it showed two out of five, right? So 40% of people don't believe that Jesus was a real person. 40% of people in the UK. Now, I don't know how accurate this stat is, but uh, it was kind of taken with the normal data structures that you would take for a study like this. So 40% of people can't say that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person, right? So I'm like, gosh, is this, this must be a thing now. And so I did a little bit more research and then I, I came across this phrase, the Christ myth theory. So I was like, okay, that sounds pretty official. Let's dig into that. Basically the Christ myth theory is saying that Jesus of Nazareth is a myth, not a real person, like never existed. That's kind of the the basic crux of that. So uh, some history scholars have made kind of quite a living off of writing books and doing speaking engagements, basically saying that Jesus was a mythical character, not a real person. Um, even in the early days of YouTube, there was a documentary that kind of made the rounds and it was called Zeitgeist. And so uh, it made this same assertion. So in the same uh, thing, they were obviously talking about, nine, they were talking about 9-11 in this documentary and all these different things. It was basically a conspiracy theory documentary, but they also threw in this Christ myth theory. Um, that, and this basically the zeitgeist documentary said that the story of Jesus was basically stolen from Egyptian mythology, you know, the stories of Horus and of Osiris and that type of thing. And then they just kind of put it all together and there you have Jesus. But I, I guess people that are, uh, Christ myth people, they can kind of be put into two different camps. And, and so the first camp is that Jesus might have existed you know, one of the guys that responded to me, he was kind of like, ah, Jesus might have existed, but we don't know anything about him. And he has nothing to do with Christianity. So if there was a Jesus from Nazareth, he has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Gospels. OK, so that's kind of one group. And then the other group on the Christ myth theory is that Jesus never existed at all, that his story is straight up 100 percent myth or fable. And then it became historicized later. Right. So it was it was a myth. And then later we kind of blurred the lines between story and history. And then people just made it history. Right. Um, and th this is just the crazy thing is that you can't even get to the question of the divinity of Jesus, which which is the core question for humanity. Right. I mean, that, that is not a hyperbolic thing for me to say. Like the core question for all of us is, is Jesus divine? Because if he is binary at that point, if, if he is, then we got to follow him. That, I mean, that's would be the only logical conclusion. And if he's not, then we're basically highly evolved monkeys. Right. Um, but the thing is, is you can't even get to that question unless you get to the historicity of Jesus. 
Because some people think that historically Jesus was not a real person. And so as I was thinking through this and thinking through, especially how I was going to respond to this guy uh, that was actually very, very polite and was a pleasure to speak with. Uh, he's a guy who didn't want to talk offline. He wanted to make sure it was all out there for the world to see. Um, but I, I thought of 10 questions that need answers. So if Jesus of Nazareth never existed, here are 10 things that we need answers for somehow. Like we, we've got to get these answers from somewhere and we're not just going to get them from sitting around. And so I want to take you through these 10 questions here. And I want you to ask yourself as I'm going through these questions, would you have known the answers to these or would you have even thought to bring this up in a debate of some kind? So just be thinking through that uh, as I go through these. So here's the first question. If Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why do the overwhelming majority of ancient world scholars believe that a man named Jesus who was from Nazareth was an actual person that existed? Okay. There are no serious ancient scholars or historians that believe otherwise, guys. There, there really aren't any. And, and I, I, I give you that caveat, serious ancient scholars right? There are people, like I mentioned earlier, they've made their career off of the claims that Jesus might have not existed, which is basically helping people with their worldview, because if Jesus never existed, it answers a lot of moral questions that people may have, or, or qualms with the church, or guilt about not going, blah, 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 blah. But almost all, right? I mean, his historical uh, significance-wise, Almost all Near East and New Testament scholars believe the history, the historicity of Jesus is completely certain. Like one of the dumbest things you could possibly do is challenge it. That's basically their position. I mean, there's three huge voluminous books that really talk about this specifically. So uh, the three that, that I found that are, are really cited a lot are the historical reliability of the Gospels. That's the first one. The second one is on the historicity of Jesus, why we might have reason for doubt. So obviously this is person coming from a more skeptic point of view, but eventually comes around to believing that this was a real person. And the third is the classical world, an epic history from Homer to Hadrian. So this is just a straight history book. This is not a theology book. This is not trying to convert anyone to Christianity. This is just basically, we're looking at the history of the ancient world, which Jesus is a large part of. So that's the first question. So let's go ahead and get into the second question. Okay. If Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why is it that the life crucifixion and death of Jesus of Nazareth is the most widely attested to event in all ancient history? Okay. This is a very, very important question. Because when you're looking at ancient texts, you have to look at how those texts were preserved. You have to look at how those were transcribed, how they were passed down. Um, and there's a reality here. There are just things in history, things that we heard in, in humanities class or ancient history class or anything like that, that we don't even question. We don't have pictures. We don't have video. We don't have eyewitness accounts of people that we knew that are like first person eyewitness accounts or anything like that. All we have is what was transcribed and written down, right? And, and then we also have to remember that things that were written down in ancient history is very, very different than we write things down now. We live in the, the, the laziest research co culture on the planet. I mean, you can find out just about anything you want on the planet, just sitting in your underwear on your couch at home, right? You don't have to actually go and search for anything. But th here's the thing. There's more evidence to show that Jesus was a real person from Nazareth, that he was crucified on a Roman cross and died. than there is evidence that the battle of Thermopylae ever happened, right? So, uh, so King Leonidas and the 300 and that whole thing, there's, there's way more evidence to suggest that that didn't happen as opposed to Jesus living, right? Like there, there are literally more attestations to the historicity of the claim that Jesus was a real person than there is that Julius Caesar was murdered on the floors of the Senate. Like there's way more to attest to that. That's one of the most famous happenings in the history of humanity, right? And little factoid, he actually wasn't killed on the floors of the regular Senate. He was killed at a Senate meeting, but it wasn't held at the normal Senate chambers that day. The day that Julius Caesar died, it was held on another place. You don't really see that in a lot of television shows, right? But, and even like, look at Alexander the Great. That's another one of the most famous people in the, in the history of humankind. There's more evidence that Jesus of Nazareth was a, was a real person than there is that Alexander the Great became king at the age of 20. That's one of the most famous parts about Alexander the Great's life. But no one really questions those things, right? Like the Battle of Thermopylae and Julius Caesar and everything that happened in ancient Rome and Alexander the Great and Attila the Hun and all these different things. No one really questions any of the things around those people's life, even if they kind of seem a little bit folklorish, right? 
But, but again, you have to ask yourself the question, if Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why is it that the life, crucifixion, and death of Jesus of Nazareth is the most widely attested to event in all of ancient history? Okay, move on to question three. If Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why have the historical records enclosed in the New Testament not been disproven by now? I mean, just think about it. The, the New Testament documents, you guys, th- those are the most scrutinized documents and writings in all of human history, in all of humanity. Like nothing would, people would like nothing more than to completely disprove and tear apart the gospel accounts of Jesus's life. Right. And yet there's been no practice. So history, archeology, span anthropology, science, I mean, just pick a medium. None of them can disprove the claims that are made there. Like the claims or the historical things surrounding what was going on in that part of the world. Nothing can show that it was false. I mean, here's the thing. You've probably heard this before. People say that the Gospels were written hundreds of years after Jesus died. I mean, you may have heard that in your Comp 1 class in college or something like that. And if you didn't have a a really robust uh, understanding of the Gospels, you may have believed them. But that's one of the most ridiculous things you could possibly say, and it's just flat out wrong. I mean, we see in Paul's writings, which were in in the very first century, it shows that people believed in the divinity of Jesus right after Jesus's resurrection. I mean, it, that's kind of the thing. If you say you're going to come back from the dead and you do it, it's like, oh, all right, we're going to go ahead and believe this person and what they say. If he says he's God, okay, I'm good with that at that point. I mean, and just think about it as well. If these things were written hundreds of years later, then wouldn't you mention the Roman sack of Jerusalem in 70 AD? I mean, this this is something that a lot of us have heard of if you if you know a lot about ancient history. And on August 6th of um, of the 70th year after the after death, um, or 70 AD rather, sorry, a little tongue tied, but that was when Rome went in and sacked the city of Jerusalem. It was one of the most insane things that have ever happened in the history of the planet up to that point. So, um, the fact that, that you don't see that mentioned in the new Testament, you don't see that in Paul's letters. You don't see that in any of the gospels is an unbelievable oversight if it actually was written way later, right? So just think about it. If you were writing a history of, uh, we'll say the last 100 years of American life, right? So the last 100 years of American history, okay? Wouldn't you include 9-11? Wouldn't that be kind of like one of the most important and crazy things that, that ever happened in the history of the United States, especially the last 100 years, Right? Or just, what if you went back all the way to the founding of our country, right? Go back to the late 1700s. Like, wouldn't you mention 9-11 even amongst the pantheon of the other things that have happened historically for our country? So so the idea that the, these things were written so far after the fact is just so stupid. But, you know, somebody smart or somebody with a PhD after their name says it, and then it's like, oh, uh, maybe it's real. So, again, if Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why have the historical records enclosed in the New Testament not, disp- not been disproven by now? That you got to have an answer for that question if you're going to claim something like that. So let's move to the fourth question, okay? If Jesus of Nazareth never existed... Then why do Josephus and Tacitus make mention of Jesus in their writings? Okay, so you may know those names, but I'll go ahead and go into who those guys are. So Josephus is a Jewish historian, a very, very famous Jewish historian. And as a Jewish historian, there's really no reason for him to corroborate something that aids Jesus's followers, you know, so let's let's go ahead and start there. So he wrote the Antiquities of the Jews. And so that was written in the late first century. Um, And in his writings, he mentions Jesus three times. And his writings, it wasn't like a book. It was like an encyclopedia's worth of stuff uh, on the history of the Jews, right? So he mentions Jesus first as the brother of James, right? So there's mention of him there. There's also mention of John the Baptist and his role in early Christianity and kind of how he attached relationally to Jesus. And also there's the Testimonium Flavianum. So that's basically means the testimony of Flavian Josephus. And this is a passage that's found in the 18th book of of his volume of uh, the antiquities of the jews and it's in chapter three and basically it describes the condemnation and the crucifixion of jesus by the romans so so three times in a jewish scripture or not not scripture but in a jewish history we see jesus 
of Nazareth mentioned, right? Again, we don't go into this to divinity because that's not what we're talking about on this podcast. We're just talking about his historicity, okay? So that's Josephus. Now, what about Tacitus? So Tacitus, you may know that name. That's a Roman historian, uh, and another guy who had no reason to corroborate something that aided Jesus's followers. Uh, and Tacitus is seen as one of the more verifiable and most important Roman historians in the history of the Roman Empire, right? Uh, he mentions Jesus in his writings called Annals, which is one of his last writings, I believe. Uh, and that's, this was written in the early second century. And so uh, he specifically mentions uh, Jesus's execution uh, under the rule of Pontius Pilate and the existence of early Christians in Rome. Okay. So there was the great Roman fire of 64 AD uh, where, you know, the uh, Nero, he basically said that, you know, it was the Christians that did it, even though it's very likely Nero started the fire himself, um, but he blamed it on the Christians. So um, here we have uh, Josephus and Tacitus that are writing about the historical Jesus, and they have no reason to substantiate him if he didn't exist, right? And then there's nothing tangible to suggest that we can't trust Josephus's or Tacitus's attestations of the existence of Jesus of Nazareth. There's nothing. So again, you have to ask the question, if Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why do Josephus and Tacitus make mention of Jesus in their writings? Okay, let's get into question number five. If Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then how do you explain why the way, which was the movement of disciples following Jesus, even started? Because again, that's another very historical, verifiable thing, was that the way, you know, the following of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, was an actual thing that actually happened, right? And that leads right into the sixth question, okay? And that is, if Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why did the Roman Empire try to stamp out the way as an affront to Roman customs and worship? I mean, if, if he didn't exist, then why would you do that, right? I mean, look at it. Run down the list. Nero, Domitian, Trajan, Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, Decius, Valerian, Diocletian, Galerius. These were all emperors that tried to stamp out Christianity within the first three centuries after death, right? So within the first three centuries that we know, that was something that was really a hinge point for a lot of Roman emperors. Now we see uh, Christians that were not only martyred, but you know they were maligned in business dealings. They were seen as kind of outside of Roman society. And so uh, again, if he never existed, then why did the Roman empire try to stamp them out? Like, why did they see that as a direct affront to the kind of the pantheon of Roman gods, right? And, and this really leads into the seventh question, the five, uh, the fifth, sixth, and seventh question really all, all lean on one another. And the seventh question is this, if Jesus of Nazareth never existed, then why are so many followers of the way willing to die horrible martyrs' deaths, right? I mean, again, I've, I've suggested a book on this podcast before called Tried by Fire. It's a history, a very, very detailed history of the first thousand years of the Christian church. And in the first thousand years, we saw some pretty terrible things. We saw Christians that were eaten alive by animals, wild animals like leopards and bears and and tigers and stuff like that. Uh, They were forced to fight against gladiators, but they were forced to fight unarmed, right? We had people that were ripped in two by horses, basically strap one leg to one horse and one leg to the other, and they were ripped apart as the horses ran apart from one another. Uh, we saw guys that were dragged down downstairs, stairways by a bull. Uh, we had people that had hot oil pulled, poured over their bodies while they were alive. We had people that had their heads covered in tar and then they were set on fire. I mean, we can't assume that thousands and thousands of people died in the first several centuries for the worship of someone specific if that someone specific never actually lived. Like, that's absurd. That's a really, really stupid thing to say. So you have to explain all the martyrs. Because if Jesus never existed, then why were so many of the followers of the way willing to die these horrible deaths? I mean, we don't have this long historical records of these people, you know, you know, basically being dragged to their deaths, kicking and screaming. A lot of these people walked calmly to their deaths. I've talked about that before. They just walked calmly. Some of them were singing hymns. They were relaxing. This was like an extension of their worship to Jesus that they could possibly die in a way that would be honoring to him. You know what I mean? So you got to have an answer for that. So let's get into the eighth question here. If Jesus of Nazareth didn't exist, then how do you explain the writings of Celsus in the second century? So if you don't know who Celsus is, no reason why you should, he's a second century Greek philosopher. Okay. Not really a major one, but he, he was one, right? He put some stuff out there and we're talking about him 2000 years later, pretty much. So this guy was a pagan. 
But his kind of claim to fame is he was the first writer that refuted the divinity of Jesus, right? Uh, He wrote uh, something called The True Word, and it was kind of the first comprehensive criticism of Christianity, okay? So uh, his work, um, Celsus's work, was likely a response to the work of Justin Martyr. So Justin Martyr is seen by many as uh, kind of the first Christian apologist. This was a guy that died in the late second century. And so a lot of the work that was done by Celsus was seen kind of as a response, uh, so they were kind of bickering back and forth. But here's the interesting thing about Celsus. Again, a pagan who was thought Christianity was absurd. He thought his followers were ridiculous. But this guy never refutes Jesus's existence. Like, ever. Not once. He doesn't think that this was a fable that some people kind of like made up that this guy even existed. He didn't think he was divine by any stretch of the imagination. This guy pretty much worshiped the sun and the dirt, right? But he never refuted his existence. But if Jesus never existed, How do you explain the fact that Celsus wrote about him in the second century? How do you do that, right? Let's get into the second to last question here. And that is, if Jesus of Nazareth didn't exist, then what is the explanation for why seventh century rabbis shunned the thought of Jesus's name being able to provide healing as per the writings of the Talmud? Okay, so... Again, in the seventh century rabbis, it was kind of brought up that, that people were being healed in Jesus's name, that there was like healing power using the name of Jesus. And they wrote about it all the way back in the Talmud. Okay. But if he didn't exist, then why would we be scared about people using his name? If he didn't exist, why would they do that? It wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? And so let's get right back, right in here to the last question. Okay. So here's question number 10 that I would ask for people. If Jesus of Nazareth didn't exist, how can you logically or realistically explain why some of us worship him 2000 plus years later? And this is probably the most important question, right? How can you logically explain that? I mean, explain that tidal wave of logic to me, because apparently I'm a little bit too simple to get it right. Because there's no reason why the way should have survived the first century. There's just no reason for it. If you look at everything that was stacked against followers of Jesus at this point, namely the Roman empire, how in the world did it make it out of the first century? And if by some miracle it made it out of the first century, how could it have made it through the next two, the second and third century? There's really no reason to explain that, right? There's, there's not a reason for that, especially if this Jesus person didn't, didn't exist. And so here's the deal is essentially, if you, if you take even the existence of Jesus of Nazareth out of history, right? So just erase it completely from history. It literally creates thousands of questions and points that can't be explained. It creates way more questions than it answers, right? If you just completely wipe them away. So here's the thing. If you believe that a man named Jesus from the town of Nazareth never existed, you are flying in the face of considerable considerable historical facts and even just basic logic and reasoning at this point. So here's the thing. And as I'm sure you would agree, as I mentioned earlier, you, if you can't come to the realization that Jesus was a real person that existed at some point on the planet, then there's no reason to discuss his divinity. Right. But this is such an important question because you have, you have to be able to ask yourself, uh, before you listen to this podcast, did you have good defenses of the historicity of Jesus? Because we we really can't take anything for granted anymore, right? With the way culture and with the climate kind of around Christianity, especially in the West, especially in America, with politics getting very, very divisive and, and, you know, Democrats going way, way, way left and some Republicans going way right, you know, we can't take anything for granted. Like we've been walking around. I certainly was thinking that, oh, it's a foregone conclusion that Jesus was a real person. Everyone just has a problem with whether or not he was divine. And that's not the case at all. Like not even a little bit. Okay. Um, and the thing about it is, is all this kind of can fall into this conspiracy theory nonsense. I mean, and we've all heard about different conspiracy theories and I don't want to go into any of them just cause it'll lend them credence, but I do want to bring up a story that I remember that Andy Stanley told. And it was a story from whenever he was in uh, divinity school. So whenever he was going to seminary, uh, so that he could eventually become a preacher. And so, uh, as he's going through one of his classes, one of the professors basically was talking about how you can't start transferring a story into being something of fable or folklore until the last eyewitness dies, right? So if we're making claims about Jesus's divinity, or we're making claims that he was resurrected from the dead, we're going to wait for that 500th person to die, right? Because again, there, there's recorded, uh, it's recorded in the New Testament that 500 people saw him resurrected, right? Not just the apostles. And so if that's the case, 
then if you were going to make something up about Jesus, you would have to wait until all of the eyewitnesses were killed or until they all died, right? That that would be how you would be able to get that because then there would be no one to refute what you were saying. And so Andy Stanley's professor, so again, I'm just trying to think through the years. It was probably in the 80s when he was going through uh, seminary school. But he basically said that within their generation that they would see people that would deny that the Holocaust ever existed. This is what the professor was saying. And pretty much everyone in the class started laughing. Like, that is such an absurd thing. Like, I mean, we have video and we have eyewitness accounts and we have all these pictures like that, that the Holocaust was a real thing. But this professor said, you just watch as, as the follower or sorry, as the people who were eyewitnesses start to die, we're going to see some of those things come out. And so even if you just look in the last few years, we've lost just about every Holocaust survivor that there is, right? And every year there seem to be more and more people that believe that the Holocaust never happened. It is one of the dumbest and one of the most mind numbing realizations that people think this way, but it's real. People actually think the Holocaust didn't happen. That, you know, Auschwitz and all these different pictures we have and, you know, all the the different videos that we have of the the prison camps and uh, the concentration camps and all the different, you know, death pits and all those things. They think all that was basically shot in a Hollywood studio. Like, I'm not making this up. This sounds ridiculous. It's ridiculous even saying it. I feel like I'm becoming dumber by even saying this out loud. But that's the world that we live in, where there's just the ubiquitous nature of social media allows stupid ideas to spread like wildfire. I mean, think of the fake news phenomenon, right? Like, if it just goes out there, even if it's retweeted by someone that works at your favorite news station, all of a sudden you think it's true. You see a meme online and all of a sudden that's true, right? But you have to ask yourself is, can your faith stack up against conspiracy theory nonsense? So, and I'm not going to go into what you think happened to JFK and what do you think about happened about 9-11 or a new town or any of these other shootings where people just have all these conspiracy theories, right? I'm just talking about the person of Jesus because there's apparently a growing trend of people that think this was not a real guy, that this guy didn't exist. There's plenty of books and uh, documentaries out there basically saying you're a lunatic if this person, if you think this person existed. But can your faith stack up against conspiracy theory nonsense? And even deeper, more than your faith, can your knowledge stack up against conspiracy theory nonsense? Do you have the ability to take in knowledge like some of the stuff I did in researching this podcast today? And is that logged away in your brain somewhere so that if somebody says something ridiculous like that at a party or in a social setting, that you can calmly and in a gospel centered manner, correct them and say, no, that's actually not true. This is actually what's true. This is what's verifiable. So this is a very, very important thing. And it really leads us into the wrap up here, which is the quick, quick resilience boost. So as you know, by now we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. Specifically, we do that by providing content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. And today I want to suggest a book to you that will help you with your mental and your spiritual resilience. And this is a book that did not make it on the 100 uh, books list, uh, the book list that's on our website, the 100 books that every modern Christian man should read list. It was just kind of right outside that top 100, but it's still a very, very important book. And the book is called Tactics, A Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions. And it's by Gregory, I think it's like Kolk or something like that. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's K-O-U-K-L. So Coke, cockle, something like that. And so in this book, he basically talks about tactics that you can use to, to share your faith with people, to have a cogent and very forthright discussion about different topics. Uh, he goes through uh, individual things that he experienced when working with people. And when running into people at the grocery store and just different conversations that he had and how to traverse those different conversations. So again, I never in a million years thought I was going to have to do a podcast on the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was like a real historical person, but y'all never be amazed at the stupid things that people actually believe. But we have to be able to say things that would be able to convince these people that they were wrong. And just like I say all the time, you have to ask these people, if you were wrong, would you even want to know? It's going to save you a lot of trouble if they don't want to be helped and if they don't really want to be any better than what they are at that point. So as always, guys, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review, please leave us one and make sure 
sure that you leave a comment for everybody as well. And then also our website, www.undaunted.life. And you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Undaunted Life and on Facebook.com backslash Undaunted Life. You can check out our free devotionals on the Version app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song King of Sorrow, which is off their latest record entitled Phantom Anthem. The links to all of this are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>